we have Tara Duncan here from the um, uh, Gage County Extension AG in conjunction with UNL, and she's going to go through an Instapot class with you all today, show you how to use that. And so with that, I'll let her take it away. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so like Mike said, my name is Tara Dunker. I am from here, but I now live in Lincoln, so I'm commuting back and forth. Um, I just started in this position back in February, so it's been maybe nine months-ish that I've been doing this. Um, I am a dietitian, so just like Lindsay and Aaron here at the hospital, the only difference is that my focus is community nutrition instead of clinical nutrition or food service. So while they're doing that stuff, I'm out in the community doing things like this, both here and elsewhere. Um, I also work with youth programs. Um, and then doing some behind the scenes work. So if somebody needs um, some wellness policy written up for their organization, or um, if we're looking to do something different with the food bank in town, things like that, um, I'm always doing some behind the scenes work like that too. Um, just a quick pop quiz I like to do. Raise your hand if you know where the extension office is here in town. Some of you do? Good. Um, for those of you who don't, I don't blame you. Um, it's kind of random too that I'm a dietitian who works on the fairgrounds. So our office is on the fairgrounds. Um, next time you drive by, you'll notice it because it has the big red N on it. Um, I'm not the only one who works there. We have five people who work there. There's a front office person. Um, she's our office manager. And then we also have a couple of people who work in 4-H, which I'm sure you've probably heard of. Um, that's most people's window into the extension world, but extension is so much broader than that. Um, I cover all things food, nutrition, and health for both this county and six other counties down here in the corner of the state. Um, we also have a horticulturalist and an entomologist. And then, like I said, a couple people who do 4-H stuff. So they're working on positive youth development in the community. Um, some of the cool things we have going on that Aaron and I are really excited about um, are some partnerships like this. But you might also see me in the hospital coming and going because um, I teach Serve Safe certification courses so people from the community who work in food service can come in here and I teach it in this room um, and then Aaron and I are, are also working on getting a local food leader coalition up and running so we have some cool things going on so if you see me in and out of the building that's where I normally work is on the fairgrounds and then that's why I'm here because Aaron and I work together on a lot of stuff so some of the stuff we're gonna do today um, we're gonna get to know our multi cooker I might say multi-cooker, that's what I'm supposed to be saying because I'm not supposed to be promoting a certain brand. However, a lot of what we've tailored this to with UNL is the Instant Pot. And that's not because we're promoting it as the best of the brands of the multi-cookers. It's just because it was kind of the first on the market and it still is the one that most people own. So if you have um, something that's not an Instant Pot and you have a comment or a question, please just go ahead and shout it out. Um, we have some time built in for that stuff, so you don't have to um, stay quiet. Life is always more fun when I'm not the only one talking in the room, right? <laughs> We're also gonna go over some safety, so that's both food safety and then also operational safety with your piece of equipment. Cooking with pressure, because that's what intimidates most people, right? <laughs> Can I see another show of hands? Who owns some form of multi-cooker already? Okay, so some of you don't, so you're here to learn if it's something that you want. Those of you who do own one, how many of you use it at least once a week? Okay. All right, so we've got some learning to do. That's awesome. Um, we'll also all briefly breeze through cleaning your multi-cooker at the end, and then basically what we've got going on up here is you have this sheet in front of you that also has my business card on it. So this is the recipe that we're doing today that we're demoing for you and you'll get to take a sample of it when you go. Um, it's basically a healthy take on hamburger stroganoff. So we've made some adjustments, which I'll go over at the end when we're serving it out to talk about how we've made it a little healthier. Uh, I already washed my hands with soap and warm water. I haven't set it to saute quite yet. Um, I did dump in the ground beef, the onion, and the garlic, so everything is pre-measured today. Um, I'm gonna push the saute button and you'll start hearing it sauteing um, pretty quickly. These things heat up pretty fast. And it's even on the less setting. So it's on the lowest setting of saute and it'll get going pretty fast. It'll beep at you once it's started heating up. So it'll beep three times once you know it's on and it's ready to saute. Um, so we'll go ahead and have Mike just man the saute to make sure we're not burning any ground beef over here. And then I'll kind of tell you why I picked it. So the reason I picked this particular recipe 
Um, not a lot of people think of hamburger stroganoff as being particularly healthy, right? Um, and we'll talk a bit about that a little bit later. But what I really liked about it for this particular class is that the features of the recipe itself really go over a lot of the things that make people nervous. So um, we're starting with the saute. So we're gonna be moving through a couple of different features as we're cooking rather than just doing one button and leaving it alone. Once we saute it, um, I'll be prompted in the recipe to press cancel. Um, the recipe also includes starchy ingredients, which get a little tricky, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and then once I've added in those starchy ingredients and the rest of the stuff, we're gonna switch to pressure cooking. And the pressure cooking, again, is what makes people nervous. So it'll start pressure cooking, and I'll just keep going on with the presentation. Um, it does do a combo, so once we're done with the pressure cooking, once it's done with, I think it's like an eight minute pressure cook, once it's done with that, the recipe asks us to do a combination of um, a natural release and a quick release. So that's a little bit complicated and makes people nervous, so I'll be able to demo that for you. And then it does include a dairy ingredient, which we add in at the end, and we'll talk about why we do that a little bit later too. Is it getting going? It is. Perfect. Okay, so first thing up is get to know your multi-cooker. So why use pressure cooking in the first place? So this slide is basically, I'm supposed to read through it and tell you that pressure cooking is a little bit faster, and we all know that um, getting a, a homemade meal on the table for your family is both good for them and both good for you, but you really wouldn't be there here if you didn't already know that, right? So that's kind of preaching to the choir. So what I decided to do instead was tell you why I like pressure cooking. Basically, I can use all the help I can get, right? So has anybody watched that Brene Brown special on Netflix about vulnerability? Nobody? It's really good. You should watch it. And I'm being super vulnerable right now by showing you my super messy house. But so um, I was telling Mike before we got started, um, I do have a two and a half year old at home. And she's an adventure every day, right? So this is um, basically what I go home to, not every day, right? But I'm a very tidy person by nature. And this is where I go to relax at night, if that tells you anything, right? And my two and a half year old, I said, we live in Lincoln. She goes to daycare and as part of her daycare, she actually gets to go to the children's museum once a week, which is great and super awesome for her. She has a lot of fun. But they have that face painting station at the children's museum. And she's two and a half, so she likes to do everything on her own. And they're good enough to let her. And so most nights she um, comes home after that, and she's two eyes and a mouth, and the rest of her face is just paint. So not only am I coming home to a messy house, but I'm also bringing home a toddler who needs to get in the bath, right? And I'm probably getting home at 5 p.m., and she goes to bed at 8 p.m. And so getting a nice homemade meal on the table is a challenge. And so um, when I found out that there was a machine that it's really marketed as you can dump everything into one pot, so that's easy cleanup, right? And then you can set it and you can forget it. I was kind of skeptical. Um, but now that I've worked it into sort of my routine, it really is true. As long as you're picking the right recipe, um, where you know, you're not having to also do something on the stove while you're doing something in the pressure cooker, as long as everything is in that one pot, it's super easy cleanup. Um, and then you really can, you know, a hamburger stroganoff on the stove top, I would have had to watch that, make sure it doesn't overboil, make sure my toddler you know, isn't messing around near the stove. With this, I just dump it all in and you'll watch me set it and then I'll go on with this presentation and then we'll get to eat it a little bit later. So why use multi-cookers um, rather than just getting a standard pressure cooker? So they can really do the job of a lot of things. Um, you can do slow cooking in the multi-cooker so it could replace a crock pot if you don't have enough storage for both things. Um, it is the electric pressure cooker, like we talked about, which just cooks things a lot faster. Um, if you eat a lot of rice, it's a great rice cooker. And I think actually, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I think Aaron told me one time that they cook their rice for this facility in a pressure or in a multi cooker. Um, so if you like the rice here, that's the way they're cooking it. Um, it can be a steamer, and then there are quite a few people, at least online, that like to make yogurt in it. I've never done that myself because I don't eat that much yogurt. <laughs> the liner is pretty huge, and so you would be filling this with yogurt, and since it's not packaged um, in a sealed package with whatever preservatives they use um, in facilities, you would want to eat that within a few days, right? 
Um, if you love yogurt, maybe that's something that you would want to use yours for. Um, and then it does have the saute feature. So again, you can do everything in one pot if you want to. And then there's a warming feature too. So if you're wanting to cook dinner earlier in the night, but you're not, you know, your spouse isn't going to get home for another hour, you could keep it on keep warm and it would be um, kept at a safe temperature for you to eat later. Okay, so some of the pros, there are pros and there are cons, as with anything. Some of the pros with the multi-cooker, it is easy cleaning, like I said. Great for small kitchens, especially if you're able to um, utilize all of the features or most of the features and then get rid of some of your other appliances. Faster cooking for busy schedules. Um, and I mentioned the keep warm function. And then it is portable. So if you, um, just like if you were taking something in your crock pot to a potluck, you could also do that with your multi-cooker. Some of the cons, so there are lots of buttons and programs. That's probably what's intimidating to most people at first. I know even when I unboxed it for the first time at home, this was probably a year ago, I was super intimidated. My husband came in and was trying to talk to me and I'm like, stop talking to me, I'm pressure cooking. <laughs> I was super nervous, but everything went well and it turned out fine. And now it's not such a big deal, right? Um, it is fast, but the name is a little bit deceiving because it's not instant and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, one thing to be aware of is that it definitely is not for all foods. And like it says on the PowerPoint, um, this is especially true for anything that you're wanting a crust or browning um, or meats that are already tender. If you're cooking it under pressure, you're probably going to have a tough meat by the end of it because you're overcooking it. Um, so why learn the hard way when I'm here for you, right? So I'll tell you one of my little, um, it was an epic fail, really. Um, so I had gotten going using the multi-cooker kind of regularly. Um, right now I'm kind of in an ebb with my ebbing and flowing. I haven't been using it a lot lately and it's made dinner a little more difficult, right? But this was back when I was really flowing with the whole thing and I was using it a few nights a week. Um, and I had found a lot of great recipes and I really hadn't had a fail yet. And then um, just a little bit of background on me. I really like beef enchilada casserole. I grew up on it and now I make it for my family. It's kind of in my regular rotation. Um, and that's, so the way I make it at home is I brown everything on the stove top and then I fill my tortilla shells, I roll them up, I put them in like a nine by 13 pan, um, put a bunch of enchilada sauce on top and then some nice cheese and then you bake it in the oven. And you get this really awesome, like somehow the top is both crispy and gooey and it's just delicious, right? So I'm in this phase of really using my multi-cooker a lot, and I happen across this beef enchilada recipe for the Instant Pot. And I should have followed my better instincts because I'm like, that can't possibly, there's no way that you're gonna get a good beef enchilada casserole out of an Instant Pot. But I didn't follow my instincts. And so what it called for, here's your liner, and we'll talk about the parts a little bit more later. But what it called for was, it said, go ahead and put your trivet inside your liner and then put a cup of water in the bottom because you need water to cook with steam, right? And then after that, it had me put tortilla shells in the bottom as my first layer, so right on top of the water. And then it had me just layer meat, tortillas, meat, tortillas with my seasonings and everything. Um, and then put the enchilada sauce on top and then put it in my um, instant or in my multi-cooker close the lid, set it to like pressure cook for not very long, maybe five minutes. Um, and when I opened it and the steam parted and I looked inside, it was a disintegrated mess. It was disgusting. They're like, there weren't any tortillas left because it disintegrated them so much. And so that would be my example of follow your better instincts. If it's something that seems like that might need a dry heat, continue to use your oven because the pressure cooker um, is using steam. And so it's just gonna soak up all that moisture that's in there. So like I said, it does have a ton of buttons. But the thing about this is that what I've kind of started to think of it as is sort of like your smartphone. So your smartphone has a ton of apps, right? Do you use them all every day or even every month? Probably not. You probably have your favorites down there in the bottom row maybe another few on that first page, but otherwise you kind of forget about the rest until you need them. 
and maybe you never need them, right? So that's kind of like the buttons on the multi-cooker. Um, you're gonna have your main ones and they're kind of those color-coded manual ones. Um, you have a pressure level button and one of the terms that you'll wanna get used to is toggling. So when I say toggle, you push this button three times and it moves between less normal and more. And what's kind of irritating is that you have to learn a whole new lingo to use the pressure cooker because less normal and more is basically low, medium, high. But for some reason they've termed it less normal, more. But as soon as you know that, it makes it a whole lot easier. Um, there is the keep warm function, like I said. This will automatically kick on, and so you um, would just have to press cancel if you want that feature to turn off. There is the delay start. One thing to know about delay start is that it's been a while since I've read the owner's manual, but I think they allow you to delay start for something like four hours. So that would mean that you're putting all of your ingredients in the pot, you're leaving it on your counter plugged in, and you're clicking you know, delay start for four hours, and then it's not cooking until four hours later. And that's unsafe, don't do that. Um, you should only leave food out at room temperature for two hours or less. So you, you're welcome to use the delay start, but I would just be cautious to make sure that you're doing it within the window where you're not putting food at an unsafe temperature. And then there is the cancel button. So this is kind of like your, your way out. Anytime you're getting a little nervous about something, you feel like maybe you didn't set up the um, venting knob properly, just press cancel. That doesn't mean that you can automatically open the lid. Um, you have to wait for whatever pressure has built up inside of it to depressurize. Um, but canceling will um, make sure that all of the heating features are turned off. Like I said, there are manual buttons. So the plus and minus on any of these machines, so this is a crock pot brand, the plus and minus, some of them have dials as well. But they adjust the cooking time, not the temperature. Um, the temperature is always going to be that less normal more thing that I talked about and you'll toggle to get there. Um, and then, yeah, so then there's also, I think I already said that, pressure level I talked about. So then there's a pressure cook button. So you would push the pressure cook button and then you'd go back to that level button and you can toggle to determine how high you want your pressure and your recipe will determine that for you. All right, so most multi-cookers do have preset programs. So those would be these ones along the side here. And then like your yogurt button. Um, again, it's kind of like your smartphone. You might be somebody who uses the soup feature a lot, but somebody else, I don't use the soup feature ever. I just use the manual feature. So you'll kind of just figure out what works for you. And then reading your owner's manual or your user's manual is obviously always a good idea. Um, I read it from start to finish um, when I first got mine, and it's a pretty easy read once you know the language. So um, being in this class is really helpful so that it doesn't feel intimidating when you're reading your owner's manual for the first time. Okay, so let's say, I'm gonna stand over here for a little bit. So, is it doing good? Yep, it's pretty much done. Okay, so we're gonna pause so that we can dump everything else in. All right, so go back to your recipe. So we've got the beef, the onion, and the garlic in there. We've sauteed it until brown. Nobody had to touch raw protein, so we don't need to wash our hands again. Uh, once it's browned, it tells me to stir in flour. I've already measured it. Does somebody want to tell me what I need to put in next? Okay. All right, so we've got the flour stirred in. That's a thickening agent, right? Make sure we don't have a watery product at the end. I've already measured out my beef broth here. It's two cups. Cream of mushroom soup. And you'll notice on the recipe when you look at the ingredients list, we're using low sodium options and the lean options for like the ground beef. So keeping that saturated fat content down as well. You said salt and pepper too? Okay. Okay. 
I'll go ahead and press that cancel button. So now we've turned off the saute feature. I'm just stirring everything together. And then do I add my noodles? Yes. Okay. I've measured those out as well. Um, that's a good question. What I would have to do to be able to answer that is to be able to compare whatever gluten-free noodles you're buying and like the cooking instructions for them to these, you know, regular egg noodles to see if the cooking instructions were different just naturally. I wouldn't think so though. Okay, so then what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that all the noodles are pretty much covered by the liquid that's in there. All right, and then am I setting it to pressure cook? Yes. Okay. So we've got my lid here. So all of them have, so you heard it make the noise. That means I set the lid on and I've locked the lid. Um, what I did before I did that was I made sure that I set my nozzle up here to sealing because since we're pressure cooking, we need it sealed so that it builds up that pressure as it cooks. Um, if we were slow cooking, we would set it to venting so that all the pressure is able to be released as it's cooking. And then let's see our time, eight minutes. Yep. So on this machine, it's the manual button. And <coughs> so I cooked this like last week, so it's already set to eight minutes. It's going to seem like it didn't do anything. And that's because it waits until it starts heating up to then beep three times. And once it beeps three times, you know that it's doing what you've just asked it to do. So basically what we're doing now is we're just letting it build up pressure so that it can um, If you don't close cook that, that thing at the top, will it alert you that you didn't do it? Yeah, it won't even let you continue. Okay. Yep, they have all sorts of, they also, I might mention this later in the slides, I think too, but they also have safety features so that if the pressure um, has not all released, um, the lid will stay locked and you shouldn't even be able to open it, at least on the Instant Pots. And that, I mean, obviously that's to say that that feature of the Instant Pot isn't malfunctioning in some way. So either way, you wanna make sure that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass this lid around now, um, just so that you can kind of see everything. But either way, you'll wanna make sure there's a little pin here and it goes up and down. And that's what, when it's up, everything's sealed. And so there's pressure built up in the machine. Once it drops, then you know that all the pressure has been released. You can twist it, open it away from yourself so that any steam that has built up is not blowing in your face. Um, I'll go ahead and pass that around. Also, um, pay attention to the ring that's inside. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. And that nozzle on top, you can play with that. You'll notice that it can pop off for easy cleaning. It's also very loose. That doesn't mean it's broken um, because it's supposed to be able to switch back and forth for that pressure and depressurization. Okay, so let's say that a recipe asks you to cook soup on low pressure for 22 minutes, you could do one of two things. You could either use that manual button or the pressure button on some machines, and you could set it, you would toggle it, one, two, three, until you get to the low, um, and it lights up on here. And if you wanna come at, up after class and see that, you can do that. Um, it, so it'll light up, um, excuse me, see I'm saying it wrong already. It'll light up less for low pressure or you could use your soup button. So you could use your soup button, do the same thing, toggle it, um, and you would just be using the soup feature for your soup. Um, it does, like we talked about, it does always return to whatever settings you use last. So time and pressure, so you'll just wanna make sure that um, it's not just doing whatever the last recipe called for. And then what if you forgot to add an ingredient? So I would say with this, um, if you forget to add an ingredient that's very, very essential, you're welcome to cancel, let it depressurize, open it away from your face, and then add that ingredient back in. But I would only do that if you're not working with some kind of meat that you would then be interrupting the cooking process and then potentially have a tough meat at the end. So like if you were doing a soup and you forgot to add a pretty essential ingredient, you're more than welcome to cancel it and then restart and just kind of try to factor in like, well, how long was it cooking before I did that? Um, but if you're doing something like a roast and you forget an ingredient, 
I would say probably let it keep cooking because once you've interrupted that cooking process, it has to then get back up to pressure. Like it's still not pressurized yet. It'll um, start counting down once it is pressurized. So all of that time and all of that temperature just kind of messes with your whole recipe. Um, so just use your best judgment on that. Any questions on that? Okay. So venting and pressure release. Um, the lid is going around. You can kind of mess with it yourself. But you'll set the um, multi-cooker to sealing when you're pressure cooking, right? You want it all sealed up so that it builds pressure. Um, and then, like I said, never open the pot while it's cooking. But there should be safety features in place that doesn't allow you to do that anyway. Um, and then always wait for that pin that you're messing with on the lid. Always wait for that to drop. Um, it is, I'm not a very tall person. So most of the time, I can't even see the pin. Um, I could here, but again, you wouldn't want to put your face over the pin either, just in case there's steam coming out. Um, so like I could do this and I can see the pin on this one, but if this was a, you know, a kitchen counter height, I usually can't see the pin and it's not an issue. Um, you get used to your machine um, and it, it becomes a lot less intimidating as you work with it a couple times. Okay, so here's some of the lingo that you'll want to know. So natural release, I talked about a little bit earlier and we'll demo it here. But basically, anytime a recipe says, um, OK, and then we want you to natural release, that means you're just letting, once this is done cooking and it beeps that it's done, you're just letting it natu naturally release until that pin drops. And that can take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Um, I would say generally you're in that range of like 15 minutes. Um, some recipes can be even higher. So it's kind of a guessing game. And if they don't tell you in the recipe, you'll just want to factor in maybe at least a half an hour, just to be on the safe side. Quick release, um, if it calls for a quick release, that means that once it's done cooking, you're taking your, um, you know, whatever utensil you're going to use to help you depressurize, and you're immediately depressurizing it. So you're switching over to venting. And then um, if it calls for a mixed release, uh, which is what this recipe calls for, so you'll see it in action. That just means that you're naturally releasing for a certain amount of time. And you'll see what it does is it counts that time for you once it's done cooking. Um, I think when it's cooking, we'll see here in a second, but I think when it's cooking, it counts down. So it'll count down from eight for us. And then once it switches over, because it's not cooking anymore, it'll start counting up. So if you have something that needs 10 minutes of natural release, it'll count up to 10 for you during that time. Um, it doesn't beep at you because you haven't set a timer on it or anything. You'll just have to pay attention. And then once um, it's done that for whatever time it tells you, then you quick release it. Can you hear it bubbling? It's starting to build up pressure up here. So yeah. So um, there are rings on most of these machines. Some brands don't have rings. I would say if you're in the market for a multi-cooker, I, w I personally would go with one with a ring because that's how you get your seal. Um, so if your ring is starting to fail, you can replace that easy enough and cheap enough, right? Um, but if your whole lid is starting to fail and you don't have a ring to replace, you would have to then replace that whole lid, which would get a lot more expensive. Um, they do recommend, so I only use one ring um, with my machine, but that's because I really don't cook sweet stuff in there. But if you are going to use it for both savory and sweet, they recommend that you have a ring for each. Just because, like, you could probably smell the onions and the garlic that I put in there. Um, that ring, since it's silicone, it'll suck up all of those scents. Um, and you wouldn't want, like, a cheesecake to smell and taste like garlic, right? So there are different sizes. Those of you who have a multi-cooker, do any of you have an eight-quart one, the giant one? OK. That serves quite a few people, right? Yeah. So this one's six-quart. And it comfortably serves my husband and myself, and my daughter eats like almost nothing. It comfortably serves the two of us, and then we always have leftovers for like a couple of days, if that tells you anything. And that's when we're putting in something like those pasta dishes that um, I gave you recipes for. There is a three-quart one. Um, it's very tiny. It's very cute. Um, but you, you can't fit much in it. There are accessories that um, come with all of them. This one in particular um, just came with these three things and then um, that trivet that I showed you earlier. Make sure I don't lose my mic again. Um, 
I think most of them come with pretty simple accessories like that. So if you're wanting to do anything a little bit fancier, um, you're probably going to have to buy or use your own accessories. Basically, just know that as long as it's silicone or metal, so as long as it could go in the oven, you can use it in your multi-cooker. I feel like maybe this thing isn't it. There we go. It was just sputtering a little bit. See, that's the kind of stuff that makes a person nervous. <laughs> but it all works out fine, right? Um, some of this um, stuff, so we have like a springform pan. So if you are going to make a cheesecake in there, that might be something that you want. Um, some of these things, um, eggs can turn out really good in your multi-cooker. Um, so certain egg molds um, or trivets that can hold eggs and you can hard boil in, hard boil in there um, would be good. A steaming um, bucket. Okay, so now we're going to go over a little bit of safety. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read these rules. There's 10 of them that we've come up with. Um, some of them are related to actual food safety and then some of them are just the safety for your machine. Um, so do not leave the house when using for the first time to ensure proper functioning. Um, that's kind of a given, right? Probably why we put it at number one. Um, never deep fry in the multi-cooker. So some people I have heard do this. Uh, the reason it's not recommended is because you would be filling your liner with oil of some sort, right? You would be putting your liner in there and then there's no lid to keep anything from splattering out. And so what could happen is that oil could then get in behind and into the heating element, which you, is not dishwasher safe. And so if you're not then getting it clean, that would be a fire hazard because you have some sort of food remnants in your, um, your actual machine. So bef number three, before venting, make sure that the valve is not directly under cabinets, lights, and that you're out of the way. Um, sometimes that's easier said than done because I don't know if you can see, but the cord is not long. Um, so if you aren't able to move it away from, say, cabinets or lights in your kitchen, um, what, which I'm not able to do, what I do at home is if you just take like a really light tea towel and you put it over the top, and then you can still use your, once the tea towel is over there, you can still use a utensil to move it to venting. Um, then it kind of disperses that steam a little bit, so it's not blowing directly on anything. Um, number four, release pressure valve with a mitt, spoon, or spatula. Delayed cooking we talked about. Don't do it for more than two hours. Don't use the multi-cooker for pressure canning. Um, so there are people who do this, and you might get one, and it says in your user manual that you can pressure can, and it might even give you really great ideas for canning. But the reason we say this is because in order for something to be deemed safe, it needs to be tested for food safety by the USDA, and none of these machines have been. So it's not recommended to can. Um, Keeping your food safe, wash all your produce before cooking. However, it's not recommended anymore that we wash protein. The reason for this is because when you're washing any sort of protein, you're just spreading germs all over your kitchen. So the protein is fine. You don't need to wash your chicken. Got it? And then do not cross-contaminate. So this would mean if you're working, like when I was working with the ground beef earlier, I was making sure that I wasn't touching or working with the ground beef and then working with a food that would be ready to eat. So like if I was making a salad with this, I wouldn't be messing with the ground beef and then messing with the salad without first washing my hands and washing any utensils that I'm using. Again, that's just to prevent spreading of germs. You work in a hospital, right? <laughs> you know all of this. Cook foods until they reach the correct internal temperature. So this is where I give a little plug for checking your meat temperatures. Um, even when you're at home, um, I'll be the first to admit I teach food safety and I'm not always great about doing this because we get busy, we get distracted, right? Um, but it is recommended to be safe to make sure that you're checking the temperature of your meat at home. So basically you'd stick this in, there's a little um, dot on there that's about two inches up. You stick it in the thickest part of your meat. Or if you're doing a breast, you could stick it in the side. Um, and we'll talk about the temps here in a second. So I'll pass this around and you can kind of just see. It's super simple and cheap. Um, it's good to have on hand, uh, especially if you're cooking for a large crowd for the holidays or something, just to make sure everything's safe. 
and then make sure that anything that you've prepared, um, like I talked about with that yogurt, we're not, we're not vacuum sealing this stuff, we're not adding preservatives to keep it fresh longer, so you would need to toss it within three to four days. Okay, so those food temperatures. So you've probably heard this one time or another, but it's easy to forget. Um, steaks, roasts, fish, or pork should reach an internal temperature of 145. Um, ground beef and eggs, that would be when you're working with whole eggs. So that wouldn't be something where you're like baking with eggs and you're making cookies, right? Um, that's 160 degrees. And then chicken and other poultry is 165. OK, so cooking with pressure. It does cook faster than a slow cooker, an oven, or a stovetop. But like I said earlier, it's definitely not instant. So um, it does take, like you witnessed, it takes 10 to 15 minutes to get to pressure. Um, right now, you can see, so we started at 8, and it's counting down. So we're at 4. Um, you do need to factor in, if the recipe calls for a natural release like we talked about, you need to factor that time in. So has anybody looked up recipes online and seen like, oh, this is a three-minute recipe? Yeah, they're not three minutes, are they? OK, so a three-minute recipe, the, thing, the math that you'll have to do is you have to factor in that it takes about 10 to 15 minutes, like I said, to get to pressure. So your time doesn't start till you're at pressure. So then it'll count down from um, three minutes. And then if that recipe were to call for some form of natural release, let's say the recipe calls for 25 minutes of natural release, you have to factor that in. So that's 38 minutes of cook time, not including your prep time. So not instant, but let's say this recipe, doing it in the oven would take an hour and a half. So it is faster, but it's not instant. So cooking liquid, it cooks with steam, so you need to make sure there's liquid in there. Um, the recommendation is at least one cup of liquid. It doesn't have to be water. I use broth today, as long as it's a thin liquid. So sauces, broths, um, stocks, things like that. Um, I am going to pass around the liner because I did want you to see every machine has a max fill line. And you just want to make sure that you're not filling over that max fill line. That would be everything that you're putting in it. Yep. And the one thing you want to keep in mind, so um, this recipe doesn't really have anything like that in there. But let's say you're making something and you have a bunch of like stewed tomatoes in there or something, and that's releasing even more water as it cooks. So you want to keep that in mind. So maybe if you're, if you're cooking with something that releases a lot of water or soaks up a lot of water like beans and expands, um, you wouldn't want to fill directly to the max fill line. You would want to leave a little bit of space for that expansion. OK, so this is an interesting thing. So when you're pressure cooking, it doesn't cook by volume. It cooks by surface area. So let's say you have a, ro let's say you have a three pound roast that you're wanting to cook. And the recipe that you found says that you need to cook this roast for 70 minutes on low pressure. Um, but you want it to cook faster. You could cut that into three one pound pieces and then divide that 70 minutes by three and you would be cooking for what, a little over 20 minutes instead. Make sense? A little weird, but it's kind of nice, right? And then we'll show this later. We've got our Greek yogurt. Add your dairy at the end because when you're pressure cooking, dairy can curdle. Um, but most recipes just have you stir it in at the end. You can even you can switch it back to saute if you're wanting to keep stuff hot and get cheese melted or whatever. Um, you might not have noticed because I did it while people were still filing in. But what I like to do, even when it seems, you know, I was doing ground beef, and usually you don't have to worry about ground beef sticking um, because it has enough of a fat content. But even when I'm doing that, I, I go ahead and spray the inside of the liner. Because what you don't want is you don't want to saute, get it set to pressure, get everything sealed up, and then have a burn message display. And it won't do anything for you until you scrape everything out of there and make sure it's good and clean so that it's not giving you the burn message. So just insurance policy, right? Spray it. And I have never had a problem with it. We talked about how it is great for tough cuts of meat, but you might want to um, stay away from doing already tender meats in there. OK, so it's done cooking. The recipe calls for a five-minute natural release. So we'll see here in a second. If I do nothing to it, it'll start counting up. 
to five minutes, and then I'll know when to quick release it. Um, and then like we talked about, you're not going to get a crust or caramelization. So if that's something that you want, um, just use your oven. OK, and then we'll go over cleaning real quick. So cleaning the lid, where did my lid go? Thank you. So the lid, I do have a colleague who, um, she puts this in her dishwasher. Um, it recommends just doing the ring and the liner in the dishwasher, but there aren't any electrical features in the lid, so it's kind of up to you. Um, I would just wonder about having the plastic break down a little too soon. Um, what I generally do, mostly speaking, the lid doesn't get too terribly dirty every time. Um, so as long as you're rinsing it off and making sure that it's free of debris, you should be fine. Um, if you are, um, I think that's on the next slide, so I won't repeat myself over and over. Um, for the most part with the lid, you can use a foam brush or an unused toothbrush to get into kind of all those little crevices if you're needing to. Um, with the liner, it is also dishwasher safe. I passed that around too, didn't I? I have too much stuff to keep track of. So this is also dishwasher safe. Um, and then cleaning the valve and the shield. So here's your, here, okay. So here's your valve and it does pop off. You can clean in there and you can pop it back on. Um, your shield is this thing on the underside with those three holes in the bottom. Um, the slide up here says that you can screw this off and remove it to clean it. This one does not. Um, I've tried every way that I can think of. Um, so this model must not have a removable um, anti-block shield. So basically what I would do is I would just make sure that I'm spraying it out really good um, or using, um, you know, if, if you have kids and you have one of those really small little bottle brushes, you could use that in there. Um, okay, so the one thing to be aware of uh, is that if you do use the quick release really often um, or you're cooking things, I like to cook starchy things in there. I like to cook, cook like pasta dishes, which is why I shared those with you. Um, or if you're cooking rice in there, you might need to just check your lid a little bit more often to make sure that gunk isn't building up. Um, because once you're doing that, you're kind of messing with the safety features of making sure that the pressure is um, building properly inside the machine. And then that float valve, um, so that pin that I talked about that pops up and down, um, if you get a dirty one, it can prevent the lid from opening. So just making sure that that's free of debris as well. Um, if you're somebody who hates water stains, I don't mind them, I don't care. Um, but if you hate water stains, um, just using a non-abrasive scouring cleanser is fine. Having water stains on it is not gonna affect the, staf the safety of the machine, it's not gonna affect um, the deliciousness of your food, so it's kind of up to you. Um, and then, like I said, the liner and the ring are dishwasher safe. And then you're just gonna wanna make sure um, that before you use your lid again, after removing this ring, that you're just making sure that you're replacing it properly because that's how it makes a seal. Okay, and then um, I say we get to eat. We just have one more minute and I quick release it, so this worked out really well. This is my first time, this is, okay, so the way that this class is generally structured is I go through the slides and then um, people are able to bring in their own multi-cookers and I have, you know, it would be a room bigger than this, but I have maybe four or five multi-cookers around the room um, and we have multiple recipes, some of them sweet, some of them savory, kind of just running the gamut to show you examples of everything. Um, and so then everybody would disperse and dump things into their pot and visit and then taste it afterwards. And so this is my very first time doing it simultaneously and demoing it. So can I have a round of applause that it worked out? <laughs> so what we'll do then is um, once it hits, you know what, I'm just gonna do it right now. So let's say that this reads five. So then at that point, that's the quick release. So that would be why you don't want your cabinets right above it, right? And you just put a towel over it and yep. Up. yep, and then it just kind of steams around instead of straight up like a geyser. So is there a big difference between the 
difference between the crop top and the Instacart? I have never, I have only used this. So I don't know. Those of you who have them, do you have a brand other than Instant Pot? Mm -hmm. You do. What's your brand? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like I said, I go through times where I'm using it a few times a week, and I'm just going through all my favorite recipes, right? Like a recipe rotation, and it works out really great, and I feel on top of the world because I'm feeding my family really good, and it's not super hard. But then, you know, life ebbs and flows, like I said, and mine's collecting dust right now. And I'm kind of sad about it, but I'm not doing anything about it either. It. Yeah. So, I mean, I do this for a living, and it's a struggle for me, right? Oh, I forgot about the one thing I did want to share with you. So, like I talked about, I made this last week so that I would have these pictures. Um, hamburger stroganoff is not generally thought of as a healthy dish, right? But I kind of wanted to talk about the ways that I, as a dietitian, serve it. Um, so this would be my plate, um, and you can't really tell in the picture exactly, but I have two versions of plates at my house in this set. I have a smaller version, and then I have a ginormous version. That ginormous version never gets used. I'm always using the smaller version, um, and how I dish it up, I'm not putting all hamburger stroganoff on my plate, right? I'm doing half my plate hamburger stroganoff, probably like a cup and a half would be my serving, um, and then the rest of it, I'm dumping salad out of a bag. I'm dumping baby carrots out of a bag. I probably washed and cut those cucumbers the day before, so super easy. And I can feel super good about what I fed my family because I know that the recipe has those tweaks that you're looking for. So you're, you're using 93% lean ground beef. Um, you're using whole grain noodles. Um, and then low sodium, low fat options for all the rest of your ingredients. Um, and then I gave an example here of how I would serve it to my toddler. So again, I'm not serving my toddler only hamburger stroganoff. Um, she has some low-fat cottage cheese on the side, and then half of her plate is vegetables. So the goal is to make half your plate vegetables or fruit, um, but I'm generally not eating fruit at the end of the day. So that's my contact information. We can go ahead and Open it up. And it does look really good as is. So if you're not a dairy person, I think it would be good even without it. But we'll go ahead and add the dairy. And none of you are probably hungry. Mike, do you want to? I have bowls and forks up here. And we can just dish up and hand out samples. And I did. While you're sitting there, I guess I did um, on the bottom of your stack of papers, if you want to fill out that evaluation, that just helps me know if the program is doing what we aim for it to do. And then I did print off um, that Tuscan chicken pasta, because that's another dish that I personally like doing at my house. So both of these have, have been tested and approved by me and my family.